Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you all to our weekly tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya Alhamdulillah we left off uh, at verse number 74 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Walutan ataynahu hukman wa ilma وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْقَرْيَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ تَعْمَلُ الْخَبَائِثَ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَوْمَ سَوْءٍ فَاسِقِينَ And as for Lot, we gave him judgment and knowledge. And we saved him from the town that was committing vile deeds. Truly they were an evil people, iniquitous. In the previous verses, we spoke about Prophet Ibrahim السلام, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the story of Ibrahim. And immediately after the mentioning of Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention to another great prophet by the name of Lut. And as we mentioned, Prophet Lut السلام, was the maternal cousin of Ibrahim. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his favor upon this, uh, this holy personality. The blessings that he has bestowed upon Prophet Lut. Allah says, وَلُوطًا آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا We gave Lut hukm and ilm. Now the word hukm in the Qur'an has different meanings depending on its context. Sometimes it refers to judgment, the ability to make sound judgment. In other instances, it refers to, to intellect. And in some cases, it refers to authority. But in this context, it seems that hook refers to nubuwa. It refers to prophethood. That among the things, the blessings that Allah bestowed upon Lut is this spiritual blessing, the, the, the blessing of Nubuwa. And he was commissioned as a prophet, uh, presumably after he migrated with, uh, with Ibrahim السلام, and Allah grants him Nubuwa. وَلُوطًا آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا Not only was he granted prophethood and notice just like in any in, in all other cases it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who grants the position of nubuwa of prophethood now Allah says we gave him hook and ilm now this knowledge that was given to uh, Lut السلام, is not the conventional knowledge that you and I are familiar with. This is not the knowledge that was acquired through, through learning or acquired from another individual, nor was it acquired through human experience. But rather you find that this type of knowledge was God-given knowledge. It's this spiritual insight. And you notice that that knowledge, this type of divinely uh, endowed knowledge is always coupled with nubuwa. That one of the key features, one of the qualities of prophets is that they are equipped with this, this unconventional knowledge. This knowledge that comes from a, uh, a divine source. وَلُوطًا آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا we gave him prophethood and knowledge. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْقَرْيَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ تَعْمَلُ الْخَبَائِثِ So among the things that Lut received as a type of grace from Allah is that he was given prophethood. He was given knowledge. And you see that knowledge is, is, uh, is not something that ends. That even as a prophet... There is this constant receiving 
of that special knowledge. In addition to prophethood and knowledge, Allah says that we saved him from the town that was committing vile deeds. Now, if you remember, Nabi Lut salam, Prophet Lut was a contemporary of Ibrahim. He was living in the same city as Ibrahim. He was in Babylon. And he emigrates with Ibrahim. And it seems that he was sent to, to preach and to deliver the message of God to, to a nearby region. And he goes and he settles in Sodom. Now, what's, what's interesting about the story of Lut السلام, is that, you know, most prophets were sent to their own people who knew them and with whom, you know, uh, they, had a, they had a history. So, for example, Rasulullah was appointed as a prophet to his own people. He was not a foreigner. Isa, السلام, Musa. They all emerged from their own communities. They were known by their own people. They had a history with their community. But the challenge that Lut السلام, had was that Lut was not a sodomite. He was not one of them. He was a foreigner. And he knew no one. You know, when he, when he entered Sodom, he didn't know anyone. He was a stranger. He was a foreigner. And he had absolutely no supporters. And historians mention that he lived and he preached. He tirelessly preached in Sodom for 30 years, three decades. Nabi Lut السلام, is preaching and, and trying to guide these people. Now, Allah says that we rescued him. Now, as many of you know, the, the, uh, the community of Lut became infamous in history as the first community to commit and to embrace homosexuality as a lifestyle on a, on a communal scale. Now, of course, before Lut, there were probably homosexuals. But for homosexuality to become so widespread and to be normalized is something that is, uh, that was, that is first seen in the community of Lut. And Allah mentions how Prophet Lut was delivered and he was saved from this community. Allah says in Surah 29, Ayah number 33, وَلَمَّا جَاءَتْ رُسُلُنَا لُوطًا the angels came to Prophet Lut in the form of human beings, in the form of handsome men. When they came to him, see abihim wadaq abihim dara. He felt sad. He felt distressed because he knew that the sodomites are going to sexually harass his noble guests. So he was concerned about them. Can you imagine living in that type of community where you cannot even protect your own guests from, from sexual violence, from being you know, uh, mistreated and abused sexually? وَقَالُوا The angels who are in human form, they say to Lut, وَقَالُوا لَا تَحْزَن لَا تَخَفْ وَلَا تَحْزَن Do not fear, do not grieve. We have been sent to save you. Your job is done. You've preached. You've tried to guide them. You've tried to awaken their, their conscience. For three decades, your job is done. You don't need to fear anymore. You don't need to worry. We are here to rescue you and your family. And your ahl, except, except your wife. And this is also an indication that we should not take it for granted that a wife of the Prophet is automatically a part of his ahl. Except his wife, she will remain among those 
who stay behind. Now, what's interesting is that the angels, when they come to warn Lult about the, the descent of divine punishment, they say that it's going to happen at dawn. So presumably they arrive in the early part of the night and they say that the punishment is set to take place at dawn. Why does Allah, why does, why does it happen at dawn? Why doesn't the punishment descend right then and there? It seems some of the commentators, they say that even for a community like, like Lut, Allah still gives them an opportunity to make tawbah. So you see that the, the door of tawbah is open. They have several hours. They have one final night to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to repent. Allah says in Surah 54, verses 33 and 34, كَذَّبَتْ قَوْمُ لُوطٍ بِالنُّذُرِ Whenever Prophet Lut warned them that your behavior will inevitably lead to chastisement, divine chastisement, they reject it. They would mock him. They would say that bring, bring on the punishment if, if what you're saying is true. إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَا Allah says, إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ حَاصِبًا إِلَّا آلَ لُوطٍ نَجَّيْنَاهُمْ بِسَحَرٍ We sent a, a type of... Uh, we made... Uh, Sandstorm, sandstone shards rain from the sky, and we rescued the family of Lut when at the last part of the night, be Sahar. Sahar is the part of the night right before Fajr. So it seems from this ayah we understand that Nabi Lut and his family and his followers, they were rescued and they were escorted. They were led. They escaped the city only a few hours before the punishment descended upon them. Now, how was this community punished? Alam al tabai in Tafsir al-Mizan, he suggests that the punishment meted out to the Sodomites was a was a volcano that would wipe them out was a type of volcanic eruption that was accompanied uh, by three distinct phenomena and these are all described in ver in different verses in the Quran so number 1 one of the descriptions that we find is that there's this seismic activity that upturned the uh, the city that the city according to the Quran was was raised and then thrown back down to the earth. Now how how and it and there are a hadith that mentioned that that Jibrail overturned the city. Now how did it express itself in the natural world? We don't know, but what we know for sure is that in Surah An Najm, which is a surah that we've We've covered, alhamdulillah. In ayah number 53, Allah says about the community of Lut, ahwa. Allah calls the, the Sodomites, the, the, the city of Sodom, as, as, as the overturned city. That it was it was raised and then it was it was thrown down to the earth. It is called the overturned city. So this is one description that we find. There are, there's another Quranic description in Surah Al-Hijr, Surah 15, Ayah number 73, where it describes a type of explosion that produced blasts and howls. So there's this like loud blast. Allah says, فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْحَةُ مُشْرِقِينَ at, the at sunrise, there was a sayha. There was a loud explosion, a loud blast. And Allama Tabatawa seems to believe that it was a, a very intense volcanic uh, eruption. So it's perhaps the eruption that they heard. It was that blast at, uh, at Fajr. 
And then the Quran also mentions the, the idea of the raining down of lava and volcanic rock. And, and some verses mention uh, that sandstone shards rained from the sky. Now, this verse is in, these, these verses are interesting because it's hard for us to imagine that our deeds trigger these natural disasters. You know, you know, sometimes we see them as completely independent and human activity has no bearing on the natural world. But a recurring theme in the Quran is that these, a lot of these things happen, not in every case, but definitely in, in some cases, these occurrences, these natural disasters are linked to human behavior, to human conduct. So in many cases, they're not arbitrary. There is, there is a reason, there is a wisdom behind these, uh, these natural occurrences. Now again, this doesn't mean that every single natural disaster is a divine punishment, but we do have uh, many indications in the Quran that these natural disasters in some cases are directly linked to, uh, to human activity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the community of Lut. So if we go back to the verse, Allah says that we rescued Lut from the city, from the town that was committing vile deeds. Alati kanat ta'amalul khaba'if. The people, the community of Lut, the Sodomites were committing vile deeds and khaba'ith is plural so so they weren't only punished because of their sexual indecency they weren't only punished because of because of their homosexual uh, behavior there were other reasons so it's so they were committing vile deeds not just a vile deed there were many sins that were being committed but definitely one of the the most abhorrent practices of the community of Lut was was homosexuality acting on those uh, those illegitimate desires if you look at uh, surah 29 verses 28 and 29 prophet Lut himself he expresses his dismay and how far these people are willing to go in, in sin and in going against their own fitrah and what is considered to be decent and in line with, uh, with, uh, with, with human norms. وَلُوطًا إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ إِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ الْفَاحِشَ مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ Lut says to his people that you are going towards an act of indecency that no nation before you had no nation has preceded you in it meaning that you are doing something that is being done for the first time on a community scale what was what, what were they doing you know some people they say you know allah punished the sodomites because they were committing rape that if it's consensual sex between the same genders then it's fine this is completely against what's what's being explicitly said by uh, by prophet Lut. he says you men are you going towards men for sexual gratification and you're cutting off the means of procreation there's no mention of consent the very act of of, of homosexuality is being condemned by Lut. And in your your pub your your public places, you're committing shameful acts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we don't care what people say, what is the norm? You know, Allah describes what they did as Khabith, something that is that is vile 
even if the entire world today says that there's nothing wrong with it, it's completely normal, you know, as long as no, they're not hurting anyone, this is a human right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is something that is vile. This is something that corrupts the soul. This is something that is against uh, the uh, all divine legislations. And then Allah at the end of the, uh, the verse, He says, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَوْمَ سَوْءٍ فَاسِقِينَ Truly they were an evil people and they were iniquitous. Fasiqin means to go beyond the boundaries. And here, it's not only that they went beyond the boundaries and they transgressed the religious boundaries and the religious laws. They transgressed even the, the norms, even the norms that you find in, in secular societies. They cross the limits of basic human decency. In, in, another, uh, in another surah, surah 27, surah An-Naml, verse 54, Lut alayhi salam also mentions, so, you know, you have men engaging in, in sexual acts with men, lesbianism was also common, in addition to that, they were doing it in public. You know, it's one thing for two people to, to do to engage in this conduct privately behind closed doors. No, this was happening in public. Now you can imagine Prophet Lut living for 30 years with these types of people. He said so the ayah says, Walut an idqala li qawmi. So he's always preaching and trying to Admonish them. Are you committing these shameful acts while you're while you're looking? Meaning that they would engage in you know, what we would call group sex in public, and people would watch. It was almost like a type of you know uh, ancient pornography that was happening, a live type of pornography so there was this public indecency so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we saved we saved him from the town that was committing vile deeds truly they were an evil iniquitous people and again this is to remind the prophet that the same Lord who rescued Ibrahim, the same Lord who rescued Lut from this difficult, miserable situation, is the same Lord who will also rescue you from your enemies and your adversaries. And, and then Allah says in, in uh, the next verse, ayah number 75 of Surah Al-Anbiya, وَأَدْخَلْنَاهُ فِي رَحْمَتِنَا and we caused him, him meaning Lut, we caused him to enter our mercy. Verily, he was among the righteous. Now this rahma, this mercy that is mentioned here, is not a reference to the universal mercy that every creature enjoys. You know, as, as, as we read in, the first line of Dua Kumail, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasi'at kulla shay. Oh Allah, we ask you, I ask you by your mercy that encompasses all things. This is not the mercy that's being mentioned in this ayah. This verse is speaking about a special type of mercy that was given to Lut. And this, and what made him earn this special mercy, and this special mercy could be the reward that he's going to receive. It could be, some scholars have mentioned that it's, it's prophethood him itself. But it seems that he was, he was appointed as a prophet before this, before he was saved from the, uh, from the Sodomites, from Sodom. It could be a reference to the reward or any type of spiritual gift that he was given. But what 
But the reason why he earned and he was given this special rahmah, it's because what? It's because he was among the salihin. And sometimes, you know, we forget this. You know, we, we, we often think that it's enough for me to have the right aqidah, that I have the right, that I'm a Muslim, I'm a Shi'i, ithna ashari, and therefore I'm fine. If you want to receive the special divine mercy, the condition is what? You have to do good deeds. Not only do you do good deeds every once in a while, you have to do good deeds to such an extent where you become someone who is salih. It becomes an estab, it becomes habitual. So there's a difference between performing a righteous deed and be being a righteous person. You know, even a corrupt person can do a good deed. But what may what makes Lut deserving of this special rahma is that good deeds were performed by him day in and day out, and it, righteousness became a part of his nature. It was part of his disposition. His nature was to be salih. There is a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he says, Al-Iman wal Amal Akhawan Sharikan fi Qarn. That faith and righteous deeds are like brothers, they are like partners. La yaqbalu Allahu ahadahuma illa bi sahibi. Allah does not accept one without the other. Allah does not accept Iman without Amal Salih. And Allah does not accept righteous deeds without, without faith. They're like two wings. They go hand, they go hand in hand. Now we go to the next verse. Verse number 76. So, so far, so this is Surah Al-Anbiya. We've mentioned Musa and Harun. Ibrahim was mentioned. Lut alayhi salam was also mentioned. And now we turn our attention to Prophet Nuh in ayah number 76. Now, what does Allah say about Nuh? So again, these verses are, are function as consolation to the Prophet and to the early Muslim community. Because if you look, what is the theme that is emerging? Ibrahim faces great opposition and he has only a few followers. Lut faces insurmountable obstacles. He has a few followers, Allah saves him. Again, Allah is gonna mention Nuh. So th these are all verses and examples to inspire hope in the heart of the Prophet that don't feel defeated, O Muhammad, because you have so many enemies and your followers are only few. Look at all of these examples of previous prophets. I was with them, and therefore it doesn't matter who was against them. Wanuhan, verse, verse number 76. Wanuhan, idna da min qabl, and remember Noah when he cried when he cried out before, meaning before Ibrahim and Lut, because chronologically Nuh السلام, came before Ibrahim. We answered him and saved him and his family from the great distress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, and remember when Noah cried out to us, when he made his dua, and Allah says, we answered his dua. Nabi Nuh salam, as is mentioned in the Quran, he preached to his people for 950 years. What, what, what is the dua that he made? What, what dua is this verse 
referring to? That he cried out to his Lord and Allah answered his dua. What dua did he make? What was his supplication? There are two possibilities and it could be both of them. It could be just the same dua. If you go to Surat Nuh, so Nuh alayhi salam, there's an, an entire surah that's mentioned after uh, Nuh, surah 71, verses 26 and 27. This is the dua of Nuh after 950 years of tireless preaching. He says, Rabbi la tadhar ala al ardi min al kafirina dayyara. Oh Allah, do not leave on the earth a single inhabitant from among the disbelievers. Why? Now, why, why is Nuh making this dua? He's basically asking Allah, oh Allah, destroy all of them. Take them all. If you leave them, O oh Nuh, so uh, Musa says, oh Allah, if you leave them, if you let them live, if you don't punish them, they will cause your servants to go astray. They will lead your servants astray. They will, they will corrupt those who are good. And they will not give birth. Their progeny, their children, their grandchildren, their descendants will be nothing but people who are corrupt, who are sinful and disbelievers. So here it's interesting that it seems that, so Nuh is saying that this seems to be a type of ilmul ghayb, a type of knowledge of the, of the unseen, that Nuh is making a very bold statement. He's saying that these people are kuffar. If they have children, they'll, they'll be kuffar. Their grandchildren will be kuffar. Now, how does he know? So he's not just assuming the worst. He, he has this, uh, this knowledge of the, the future. He has ilmul ghayb. So this is the dua that he makes. He makes this dua, oh Allah, punish them. There is no goodness left in these people. Another verse that mentions this, this desperate dua of Nuh, Surah 54, ayah number 10, Fada'a. Oh Allah, I am overcome. I am overwhelmed. So come to my aid. Come and help me. So he makes this dua, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms Nuh's conclusion and, and justifies his feelings of hopelessness. Allah in Surah. Surah Hud, Surah 11, ayah number 36, he confirms the conclusion of Nuh. وَأُوحِيَ إِلَىٰ نُوحٍ It was revealed to Nuh أَنَّهُ لَيْ يُؤْمِنَ مِنْ قَوْمِكَ إِلَّا مَنْ قَدْ آمَنْ O Nuh, no one will believe in you except those who have already believed. Meaning, no one else is going to believe in you. فَلَا تَبْتَئِسْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْعَلُونَ Do not be do not feel sad. Do not feel distressed over what they do. Allah will take care of them. Now, you have to understand that this dua, this harsh dua, he's asking for adab, for punishment to come down on his people. You know, this was not a dua that was made after six months, after a decade. This is after 950 years. And this is after preaching day and night in Surah Nuh, verses 5 and 7. Nuh alayhi salam, he, he mentions and he speaks about how much effort he put into trying to guide these people. Oh my Lord, I called upon my people day and night. And believe me, brothers and sisters, this is not an exaggeration. When Nuh says that I called upon them day and night, it doesn't mean that some days he preached and other days he takes the day off or Saturday and Sunday is the weekend and he doesn't... Literally seven days a week, he would preach 
And at minimum, he would preach in the, in the morning and in the evening. At least two times a day, he would deliver a sermon. And this continued for 950 years. And they threatened to stone him. They threatened to uh, banish him. They abused him verbally, physically. And then Nuh complains. He says, فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا Oh Allah, the more that I preach to them, the only thing that it does is that it pushes them further away. So it's not that they're making small progress. They're going, they're becoming more and more rebellious. وَإِنِّي And, and look, at, look at how sad this is. Look at the sabr, the patience of Nuh. وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعَوْتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ you know, it's one thing if Nuh is saying that Allah is going to punish you. This is what Jahannam is like. He talks to them about death, you know, the doom and gloom. He's speaking to them about Allah's rahma, Allah's forgiveness. He's using very soft language with them. Nuh says, and any time that I would, I would call them to your forgiveness. So this is a very positive message. He would speak about Allah's rahmah, that don't think that you've drifted far away. You can still come back to Allah. Allah will pardon you. He'll bless your dunya and your akhirah. كُلَّمَا وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعَوْتُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ What did they do? جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ When Nuh would speak to them about God's mercy and his love and his affection, and that he will pardon them no matter how many sins they commit, they would put their fingers in their ears. Can you imagine? Someone as noble and as dignified, as learned, a prophet of God is speaking. And look at how immature these people are. He's speaking and they put their fingers in their ears. Now, you know, it's immature to just do, to stick your fingers in your ears. But not only that, they cover their faces, meaning they don't even want to look at Nuh because they're afraid his, number one, they put their fingers in their ears, they're afraid that Nuh's words will soften their hearts and they don't want to listen to the message. They don't even want to look at the face of Nuh because his face might have an effect on them. Just looking at the nur of his face, this, the, the spiritual light in his face may soften their hearts, and they don't want that. And they, had, they were adamant. They had this arrogance in their hearts. They did not want to submit to the truth. So imagine living in those conditions, preaching under those circumstances. This was causing Nuh great distress. 950 years, and you're only able to recruit 80 people. And then in ayah number 77, And we helped him against these people who denied our signs. Truly, they were an evil people, so we drowned them all together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped, helped Nuh against these people. Now, there's one final comment that I'd like to mention, and that is the drowning of the, uh, those who rejected the message of Nuh. And this raises an important question about the flood of Nuh. Now, the predominant opinion among the scholars of tafsir is that the flood covered the entire earth. If you look at most of the commentators, they say that this was a global flood. However, there is no textual evidence, unlike the Bible, which is very explicit that this was a global flood, 
there is no textual evidence in the Quran that explicitly states this. But there are, but we have substantial and in some cases explicit evidence of the following. So there are two things that we know for certain. Number one is that Nuh السلام, was one of the prophets of Ulul Azm. He was one of the messengers of great resolve. And in fact, he was the first messenger of great resolve. Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and our prophet. Now, one of the meanings of being a messenger of great resolve is that these prophets had a mandate to guide all people. So everyone in the, the world at that time, Nuh السلام, was the prophet. He had a mandate to guide all of these people, either directly or through his students or through letters or whatever it may be, any means of communication. So we know that Nuh was a prophet appointed by God. He had a mandate to guide all people on earth. Number two, so that's a fact. Number two, every last human being alive at the time of the flood was destroyed by the flood, except Nuh and those who believed in him. And those who joined him on the ark. Now, based on these two facts, if there were people scattered all over the world, then necessarily the flood must have covered the entire earth. However, if people, and this is very possible, if people only lived in a limited part of the world, then the flood need only have covered that portion. So if people only inhabited a third of the earth, the flood does not need to be a global flood. It just needs to be a, a flood that's going to destroy all those who rejected the message of Nur. So in a situation like this, my dear brothers and sisters, there's no need for us to commit too strongly to either possibility. So we don't know, and the Quran doesn't explicitly say whether this was a regional flood or a global flood. So, uh, so that's 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 important for us to be uh, to be aware of. Now, again, as I mentioned, and we'll conclude here, the theme that is emerging, the theme of all of these prophetic stories, is that these prophets faced incredible hardships. They faced a lot of resistance. They had fierce adversaries. And in most cases, they only had a few followers. They, they had very limited resources. An example after example, Allah is showing the Prophet and the, the nascent Muslim community that, that, look, I came to the help of past Prophets and I will come to your help. I will aid you and I will support you provided that you have faith and you put your trust in me. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Inshallah, next, uh, next week we'll uh, cover verses 78 onward and we'll be speaking about uh, Sulaiman and Dawood. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. So are there any accounts of uh, how people reacted to Prophet Nuh's old age? Because it seems miraculous that he lived to be this this long. So you know that's that's an interesting question, and uh, we, there is no uh, account that I found that uh, that documents any. Uh, any surprise from anyone that uh, that he had lived uh, so long? Again, I, I'd have to double check, double check, but I don't recall anyone saying that. You know, how are you still alive? You know, you know what's your, what's your secret? So that that's that's pretty astonishing that there are no uh, 
reports of uh, of amazement. You know, anyone just remark, you know, making any remark about uh, about his his uh, the length of his life. I haven't come across anything. And could you comment on why it's important to know whether the flood was global or not? Say, can you repeat the question? Um, it's just a question of wh why is it important to know whether the flood was global or not? Because, you know, some people, uh, you know, it's, it, it goes back to a theological question, and that is that some have said that, you know, if you have, if there's a global, so one one problem with the the idea of a global flood is that some some say that there is no archaeological evidence. Scientists have not confirmed, or some in fact have rejected the idea of a, a global flood during the time of uh, of Nur. Again, the Bible is much more explicit about timeline and. And this idea of a global flood, but just just to to point out that the Quran doesn't make any uh, mention about this the uh, the about whether it was a global flood or a regional flood. So just to kind of draw that distinction between the uh, the Quranic narrative and the biblical narrative. And for uh, the the calamity that affected Prophet Lut's people, are there any? Um, Arguments that people make against it being a volcanic eruption or something else? So, Alama Tabatabai, he seems to go into the most detail about the, uh, the nature of the, uh, the natural disaster. Other, other commentators, they, they just speak about uh, the idea of, of Jibra'il, you know, overturning the the city with uh, his wings. So they speak about about it more from that uh, that unseen aspect. But I haven't seen any other explanations as to some maybe may, some may believe that it was a type of earthquake. But uh, the description of Alama Tabatabai seems to be uh, the most uh, plausible. If you collect all of the other descriptions in the Quran, it seems to have been at least part of the uh, at least one of the natural disasters that was occurring was th was this volcanic eruption now the overturning of the city it could be a combination of uh, of a violent earthquake and a volcanic eruption because we know that the city was overturned and the uh, the verb ahwa is mentioned that it, it was it was kind of thrown down and that would imply that it was raised for it to be thrown down. So, so it seems that it's a combination of some type of volcanic uh, eruption and, uh, and, and some violent uh, earthquake that just completely upended or, uh, and upturned the city. And we have two different stories here of communities that were so far gone that they had no redemption and they had to be completely eradicated. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about what got those cities to get to that point and where they there was no chance of redemption? Now, <clears throat> the Quran seems to suggest that, you know, if you look at the Quranic descriptions of, of these communities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as qawma su'in fasiqeen, that excessive sinning right? continuously and consistently crossing the uh, the boundaries the, the religious boundaries the the boundaries of of just basic human conscience you know going against you know the fitra so excessive sinning not repenting and especially when this happens on a communal scale, and people abandon the responsibility of enjoining good and forbidding evil, that's what seems to, to, to get you to that point. Now, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, and those who are endowed with knowledge of the unseen can make that judgment. You know, we can't 
condemn people's hearts. We can never point at someone and say, this person is doomed. They have no chance of redemption. Only Allah is acquainted with the inner workings of the human heart. And he knows that if this, he knows if this person has sealed their own hearts. So we don't know. We don't know when a person reaches that point. That that is something that is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we know that rejecting the truth, you know, because of arrogance, because of dunya, and continuously sinning and transgressing does lead you in that direction. Now, at what point do you reach, you know, the point of no return? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And that's why it's important for us to immediately ask for forgiveness and repent when we commit sins. But it goes back to this, uh, you know, the sin of rebelliousness. I mean, if you look at the attitude of the community of Nuh, I mean, imagine reaching a point where you, you develop an aversion to God, to morality, and you just become so engrossed in the material world that you don't, you don't even want to listen anymore. You don't even want to consider the, the truth of the message, that you lose your ability to objectively analyze uh, any message. So, so really rebelliousness and arrogance are things that we have to avoid to, to, to prevent ourselves from, from taking that same path and, and reaching that point of no return. And... Uh... Similar, a question along the same lines uh, related to this. How, how does free choice work? Because Allah can see the future and he knows your choice. And to suggest that he doesn't know your choice would mean he wasn't all powerful. So, so the question is about free will. How do we reconcile free will with God's knowledge of what we will do in the future? Uh, exactly. So this is, this is a topic that has been discussed in great detail. And it's, it's a difficult concept for us to grasp because we're talking about divine knowledge. Now, Allah's knowledge that something will happen does not negate a person's uh, free will. You know, and, and, you know, one example is that if you see someone walking someone who's blind and you see that they're walking and there's a, a ditch and you know, you, you're certain that they're going to fall in the ditch. They're blind and they're walking. You know, they don't, they don't have a, a, a guide dog or anything. They're walking and you see that there's a ditch in front of them. You know, one step and they're going to fall over. Now your knowledge of them falling into that ditch has no impact on their free will. So my knowledge does not compel that person to fall in the ditch. Similarly, Allah, and this again, this is just an example. It's not the perfect example, but just to help us grasp this, uh, this concept. So Allah's knowledge does not negate our, our free will in the same way that my knowledge that a blind man is going to fall into a ditch when, if he's walking does not compel that person to fall into that uh, that dish. And this, of course, this discussion, this question requires much more discussion. There are different angles uh, that are mentioned in the ahadith, but just very briefly, God's knowledge does not negate uh, a person's free will. Thank you very much, Sheikh. This was a Really interesting class and went a lot really in depth into these stories. That was very interesting to learn. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, we continue uh, next week.